morning, everyone. Welcome to the mobile track. Next up, we have Stefan Esser with exploiting the iOS kernel. Okay, welcome to my talk about exploiting the iOS kernel. And uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm Stefan from Germany, and I'm mostly known for doing PHP security stuff. But uh, since last year, I'm concentrating on uh, um, iPhone stuff. I did the ASLR implementation for jailbroken iPhones in December. And then um, a part of the official jailbreak by the iPhone dev team in uh, like April or so. And yeah, I work for, uh, partly work for a German web security company called Section One. But I also work as independent contractor right now. So what I want to talk to today about is um, a short introduction about um, iOS kernel exploitation, um, some uh, highlights, some similarities, and some differences to uh, uh, the macOS kernel. And then I will give a short uh, introduction how to activate the, the kernel debugger in, in iOS. And then I walk you through the exploitation of a stack buffer overflow and the uh, exploitation of a heap buffer overflow in the iOS kernel. Uh, I will not uh, disclose any zero days, so this will be bugs uh, already uh, public. And uh, in the end, I will um, tell you something about the kernel patches used by jailbreakers to disable all the security features. So this is basically the things you are going after once you have achieved code execution in the kernel and you want to disable all the uh, security. So let's start. Um, when you look at the iOS kernel, you will realize that uh, it's very similar to the macOS kernel, at least uh, a large part of it, uh, because uh, the iOS kernel is based on the same XNU source, uh, source tree as macOS. Uh, at, some uh, at some point in time, they were like branched and sometimes branched back together. And um, so they are very similar. Um, well, the kernel drivers are a different thing, but uh, just the, the main kernel, the core kernel, is uh, more or less the same. Um, when you look at the macOS kernel or iOS kernel, you will see that there are no uh, mitigations against uh, kernel vulnerabilities inside the kernel itself. So the kernel is only trying to protect as best as possible that the user space cannot do something uh, with sandboxing and all this kind of stuff. But inside the kernel, there's no mitigation like stack cookies or uh, heap canaries or something like that. Like that. Um, this also means when you're looking for uh, uh, iOS kernel vulnerabilities, you can take the, uh, the XNO source code from the open source uh, apple.com website and can just audit it. And you will find some bugs, some vulnerabilities, and um, yeah, or not. But uh, you still can find some, something in there. And uh, once you found it, you can exploit it. Um, the other thing that's different is when you look at the bugs you're searching for, uh, they're different between uh, macOS and iOS. Because, uh, well, I come to that now. Um, when you look at macOS, you will see that user land dereference bugs are not possible because uh, the user land and the kernel space are not sharing the same uh, address space. Uh, in macOS, they are actually starting both at zero. And in iOS, it's different. In iOS, um, you have all the kernel above two gigabyte, and the user land is below one, uh, two gigabyte. So uh, sometimes these kind of bugs are exploitable or you can use this feature to, uh, during kernel exploitation. Um, when you look at OS X, nothing is, um, usually nothing is sandboxed. Uh, nowadays in Lion you have several things sandboxed, but in the uh, previous version there was nothing sandboxed. So uh, the only thing you wanted to have on OS X was you wanted to get root. In iOS, that's just the starting point. What you need is you need code execution in the kernel to disable all the security features. And therefore, on OS X, yeah, uh, code execution or memory corruption inside the kernel is, uh, is nice to have, but it's not really uh, required. You just need a bug that gives you root. Um, 
in iOS, you always need memory corruption or code execution in the kernel because otherwise you cannot dis disable all the security features. And the last thing that's different is when you have a, a bug in a macOS, a kernel bug that is only exploitable as root user, uh, you usually don't care because there's no code signing and things like that. So if you're already root, uh, you don't care. And if you're already root, root you're most probably also not uh, in a sandbag, sandbox and those kind of things. So um, you don't care about this in, uh, in uh, macOS. But in iOS, uh, these things are very valuable because you require them to stay on the device when it uh, reboots. You need uh, to be able uh, to uh, exploit the kernel from the boot chain and uh, at that time you are root, so you can use bugs that are only exploitable as root. So the jailbreaking scene uh, therefore distinguishes between uh, normal kernel exploits and uh, untethering kernel exploits. And with a normal ex kernel exploit, you try to get from the mobile user to the root user and break out of the sandbox, execute code in the kernel, and um, yeah, and the problem here is it must be done 100% in, in return-oriented programming um, because uh, there's no such thing that you can just uh, like upload code and uh, call mprotect and make it executable. Um, well, in the newest iOS versions, there is like this uh, dynamic uh, code signing in Safari and so on. You might abuse that for, for that, but in the older version, it's, uh, it's not required. Yeah, untethering exploits, on the other hand, are um, already running as root. And um, yeah, they only patched the kernel to disable the security features. So you again need to have memory corruption or code execution in the kernel. And in the early days, you could just like use a short ROP payload and use a sysctl command to uh, disable the, some of the kernel features, the protections, and then you can just uh, upload a binary and execute that. Um, since iOS 4.3.0, that's not possible anymore. The, uh, the untethering exploits must be done 100% in uh, ROP. So when you want to get started exploiting, uh, first you need a device. I recommend uh, an, to get an iPod 4G because it's very similar to an, um, to an iPhone 4 and you don't have this GSM and CDMA stuff which will stop you from uh, downgrading or make it harder to downgrade to older versions of the software. Um, in addition to that, you still have a boot ROM exploit in it, so it's very uh, nice to, to start with that. But of course, you can take your iPhone or something else or your iPad as long as you have like an <clears throat> it in a way that you can uh, actually work with it. So you should have a jailbroken already so that it's easier to develop and exploit on it. Or you should have a, a development phone. Uh, taking, uh, well, just make it a development phone. But uh, if you just try to use it a factory phone, you always have the problem that in order to do some analysis, you have no help whatsoever. You have to do everything blind. So, and when it comes to testing, you have two different ways. You can like crash the kernel and then look at the panic log and the, at the panic dump and uh, just analyze the, uh, the values and do something. Or you can um, use a kernel debugger. Well, the kernel debugger is something Apple forgot or, well, left in the iOS kernel for no, for no reason. Well, at least I don't know a reason because there's uh, there's no thing uh, like uh, users or iOS developers to create kernel drivers, so they don't need a kernel debugger. They're not supposed to do it. And, um, but when you look at the kernel, you will see that it's still in there. You will find like uh, the code, the KDP. You will find uh, that it uses the, debug, uh, the boot argument for the kernel debug and things like that. So the kernel debugger is still in there. You can see it very easily. Actually, I'm not so sure if they will remove it from iOS 5 or so. How do you debug Well, they, they can just like uh, create a debug version for themselves and remove it uh, for the factory phone. Of course you can do that. Yes, you can do that, but what if, what if they get a unifactual field that's been panicking all the time? How do you introspect the kernel then? Okay. 
yeah, when you want to do it like this, yeah, it's easier for them to do it. Well, you can, they can still like try to do some, well, okay, at this time it's jailbroken, so it doesn't help you to have code signing on, on, on the kernel protocol, okay, yeah. I would remove it, but I'm not having to support like millions of users, so yeah. So anyway, they left it inside, they left the KDP inside. KDP is uh, also the same thing as an OSX. Um, the problem is KDP is designed to only speak Ethernet or um, serial. And when you have like an iPhone, you don't see like an Ethernet plugin or a uh, serial plugin. And so you have the big question how to communicate with it. Um, actually, I don't know if this USB MUXD uh, protocol uh, is able to speak UDP. I never tried that so, because I found another way. So uh, the idea is actually very simple. When you look at an um, iPhone dock connector and see the pin out, you will see that there, some, there are two pins that are very interesting called uh, serial RX and TX. Uh, and this is basically a serial, uh, you can speak serial with the iPhone. And, um, but the problem is there is no uh, cable I know of that you can buy that will give you serial directly. There is one now. Yeah, okay. Great, you can buy it now for 50 bucks. I, I, I build it for fix 50 buff, bucks. Um, so uh, the other question is if this gives you only serial or if, you give, if it gives you serial and USB at the same time. Yeah, be, because uh, just serial is sometimes a very, very bad. Uh, so you want to have both at the same time. So this is basically, I, I bought these few ingredients. Uh, I will go through that very fast because you can look it up. It's not really hard. There are like a few ingredients and you just put them together. And I'm very bad at soldering stuff, so I was able to do that. Um, I once nearly destroyed my Xbox with soldering, so uh, yeah. <laughs> mm. So if I can do it, you can do it too. Um, yeah, and basically what I did is I export both uh, serial and USB because when you do some, uh, you trigger the exploit, you do it usually by SSH. And having a wireless SSH at the same time while running the kernel debugger uh, doesn't work well. So um, it's better to have it over USB than it's, uh, it's uh, um, more stable. You don't lose the SSH connection all the time. Um, yeah. So n your next problem is that now you have like this, this cable and you can plug it in, but you don't know how to speak with it. So uh, the nice thing is uh, Apple um, ships uh, a GDB in, in iOS, in the iOS SDK, with ARM support and um, uh, KDP support. Well, they could remove that at least. Um, yeah, but you can still use the old version then. Um, however, uh, it only speaks uh, KDP over UDP and uh, over serial is not supported by default. At least I don't know of it. But um, another guy had the same problem as me, and, uh, but he was uh, debugging MacBook Airs, I think. So he wrote a little proxy tool that will just speak U fake UDP over serial. And uh, yeah, you can download this. Uh, you have the slide on the CD. You just look up his name and or the name of the, of the thing, and you can download it. Uh, Yeah, and once uh, you have that, you need to activate it. And um, like I said, you have, you have to have a jailbroken iPhone that, for that or an old device so that you can give boot arguments. Uh, so with all the devices before iPad 2 key, you can just take Red Snow, the latest version of Red Snow, and it has a command line uh, option to give arbitrary boot arguments meanwhile. So you can just put in debug equals one or something like that, and then you get, uh, in this case, you get uh, the debugging debugger halting uh, the kernel at boot time. Um, yeah, and once you have done that, uh, you can just use GDB and connect to it with uh, using the KDP uh, functionality. Yeah, in this case, you attach to localhost because uh, the proxy runs on localhost. Okay, so now you know how to use the kernel debugger. We will not think, uh, think about it uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, so uh, let's look into real exploitation. Um, I want to start with a stack buffer overflow. And actually, I will start with the uh, um, stack buffer overflow used for the untether 
of uh, iOS 4.2.1 uh, until 4.2.8, I think. Maybe I'm off uh, one version. But um, the thing here is, this is one of the exploits that requires root permissions. Um, but it's OK, because it's an untester, so it's somewhere in the root chain. Uh, well, when the user land starts up, I, I mean. And um, so you have root permissions at that time, so there's no problem. Um, the exploit itself, or the bug, was found by POT2G, which is one of the chronic dev team. And um, what it is, it is basically some functionality that, um, is, no, it's the support for the old HFS format. Um, and when you load an HF, HFS image and it's uh, malicious, then it will trigger uh, a stack-based buffer overflow inside a conversion routine that con converts from Mac Roman to Unicode. Um, here's the function that does that. Um, you will see the most ironic thing here is that there's a, a parameter to this function called max charlen, which is unused. Um, it's always a good idea to, to pass the maximum links and then don't use it. Um, <laughs> And what's even more funny is that uh, the official fix for this vulnerability from Apple still doesn't check that. They just check it on few calls for this function, if, and they check before if it's overlong or not, but in some calls they don't check it. So there might be other ways to exploit this vulnerability still. So um, basically what, what it does is it, it takes the first character because it, uh, it believes to be, uh, to be a Pascal string, and the first character is the, uh, the length of the string, so it takes the first character and loops that often. So no, no size check. And it will just, uh, when it's a character in, in the low ASCII segment, it will just write the character with an uh, additional zero byte, like Unicode writes. And in the other way, it will look up uh, the character in some lookup table and write something. Uh, well, we don't need that. We just ignore it. So how do you trigger this bug? What you need is you need a HFS image and this is the header of an HFS image. It's actually inside an image at the third sector. And you can see um, there's one character array, which is, you can see it because there's the sizes in red. Uh, and this is basically the name. Well, we can just ignore that. Just create a hex editor. Uh, you take a hex editor and create your image. So you see there's an image and hex a dump of an image, there's this uh, marker BD, which, uh, which is the marker for an HFS, there's some value set, and then there's just like a very long name. You see ABC and so on. This is like far longer than allowed, I think allowed is like 28 or so characters, or 20, something around 30 bytes, and, uh, but it's far longer. So, um, and then you just load this, you can load it with, uh, with uh, a code like this, uh, and uh, once you load it, you crash the kernel. So now, once you crash the kernel, what do you do? You uh, go to this directory, library, uh, logs, panic, panics, no, crash report or panics, and then there's a panic log. You look into it, and you will see something like this, which is quite complicated. Um, but you only care at the moment about this which gives you an overview uh, of the, uh, the actual fault, uh, the register rallies at the time, and, and something like that. Um, and you see you control some of the registers, like R4, R5, R6, and um, you can see where it crashed and where the function was uh, called from. Um, because you see the program counter PC and the link register LR, uh, which is the previous function. Uh, well, the return address to the previous function. When you look up the actual program counter you see here in uh, IDA, you will see something like this. Um, this is unexpected because you thought maybe you get total correct, uh, control directly, but it's not like this. So you have to trace it back and see why it's crashing there, where it's coming from. So you go to the function that's uh, addressed by the link register. And you will end up in this function. Uh, this is a source code from XNU, so it's easier to see. So basically what happens here is the crash occurs inside the call to the uh, function at the bottom, the UTF-8 encode string. And you can see um, that the, over the overflow is supposed to happen in the other one, in the, uh, the first function. 
Um, so you see there's a way to skip out of the function between that by having a unicount of zero. So, well, let's set this unicount just to zero and uh, try it again. So uh, we look a little bit deeper with IDA and see uh, into the stack layout. You see here the stack layout, uh, you have the, the, the string, the UTF-8 LAN, the unicount, and a few registers, and the program counter. You see there's no stack cookie, so you can just like overwrite everything. And um, so we just improve our HFS image. And you see now we have like set the unicount to zero and try to set some values for our, our four, five, six, seven, and PC. And then we try the same thing again and get another crash dump. And now you see you, you control all the registers R4 to R7, and you also control the program counter. One thing you see here is that you might expect that the program counter is 450045, uh, but um, the lowest bit of the address of the program counter is actually used for switching between thumb mode and arm mode. And um, in the control register, you can see that arm mode, uh, thumb mode is activated, so uh, basically you can uh, subtract one from the, uh, from the PC and you see it's like uh, controlled. Well, I could like take a different example to make it more obvious, but uh, I was lazy. Uh, I didn't realize that after, after I saw the crash dump that uh, like this, I, uh, this number was actually bad. So, okay, now you control the program counter. The next step is how you get code execution. Um, of course, you can jump anywhere in the kernel space, usually when you overwrite the, pro the, the program counter. And uh, one thing about iOS kernel is that uh, a lot of the memory or maybe all inside the kernel is somehow executable. I think Comex once said that this was different in, in earlier days. That's why he had some special kind of kernel patches in his uh, old jailbreaks. But nowadays, there's no protection at all. You can just jump to some heap memory and it's executable somehow. Uh, I don't know if it's like broken or if Comex is wrong and it was never like this. It just works. Maybe it doesn't work in iOS 5 anymore. Um, but I used it in my, in my previous exploit for the jailbreak to just like have some heap memory that it's, I'm just jumping into it. Um, yeah, and the other problem is you need to know the address of the, uh, the code you, you put in there. And when you're into macOS expo exploitation, you know that there's a, a lot of papers or so from Nemo, and he also wrote a chapter of the, of the kernel exploitation book uh, about OS X exploitation. And he shows you some ways to get like uh, stuff into the kernel at a fixed address. Uh, not fixed address, but an address is that you can leak easily. Um, I don't know if this still works because I don't use that on, on iOS, but uh, it should, should still work. Um, I think I tried it in the past and it worked, so uh, maybe it still works. Okay, what can you do else? The next thing is we can like return into the kernel itself and use uh, kernel level return oriented programming. And because there is no R, um, RVX protection, uh, no NX protection inside the kernel, uh, your ROP payload is very short. You just like, uh, jump to copy in, to copy uh, some memory from user space into a kernel space, and then you just return into that uh, copied memory. Of course, it only works if you know the, uh, the address in, in, in user space. But usually when you have like a kernel exploit, you can map memory somewhere and yeah. Yeah, and it's very attractive to have return oriented programming in the kernel because there are not so many different iOS kernels around. And um, when you use r the gadgets only in the core part of the kernel, they're even uh, the same for multiple kernels. If you use some, something in the driver, in the space of the drivers, you, they are not the same because the drivers are like shuffled for devices, for different devices. But uh, the, um, the core kernel is always like the similar or same for the same uh, CPU. and firmer version, naturally. Um, yeah, you can return to it and then you have the execution. The problem here is in our demo bug, uh, we cannot do that because it's a Unicode overflow or Unicode conversion overflow and the conversion routine doesn't allow us to write uh, addresses uh, in, in the uh, kernel space, uh, well, in the uh, kernel code space. So uh, we cannot just return there. So we need something else. 
Um, I also thought about like a, a partial address overwrite, which would be possible here, but you would still be very limited and it's very unlikely that you can uh, do something with it. Uh, but luckily, this is iOS and not macOS. So I told you in the beginning, the user space here is uh, mapped into the same address room. And therefore, you can just return to an address in user space. Um, for example, you have like a binary that maps uh, executable code at, uh, at this 10000 uh, or 10001 address. And then you um, just return there and it executes your code. The only problem here is it must be marked as executable, the memory. And one other thing is when you look at the exploits of comics, he always does an M lock of this, uh, of this address. Uh, the, um, the other jailbreakers don't do that. I guess Comex does that because he wants to protect against some mapping out of the, of the memory. Um, I always also do that because Comex does it and usually what he does is quite, uh, what he does is quite useful. So, um, um, but you see, when you look at the exploit of like uh, the chronic dev team, you see that it's not really needed. It's uh, usually still works. It's, um, yeah. Well, the idea is that you like hardwire it so that the kernel doesn't like remove it while you jump into the kernel. Yeah, and you just return there and then you have uh, code execution. So it's very simple. You just map your, 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 your payload at some, uh, some point, executable, by loading a Maho library, and then it's working like that. Okay, so stack overflows are very simple. Let's get to uh, heap buffer overflows. Uh, stack buffer overflows, sorry. Uh, not to insult someone here. Uh, so it's stack buffer overflow, not stack overflow. Um, yeah, and yeah, let's go to the heap buffer overflows. And um, this time I show you a bug of mine. Um, it's quite complicated to exploit it. It's inside the socket option handler for the NDRIV uh, protocol of this uh, yeah, NDRIV set DMX spec uh, opcode or whatever you call it. And basically there's a DMAX count and you can send, set it to a very high value and then you trigger um, uh, an integer overflow in a multiplication of, for memory allocation. And again, it requires root permissions and uh, nowadays it's closed by Apple. Okay, so the whole thing is a little bit complicated so I will walk through this a little bit different than the stack overflow. So you see, uh, there's a DMAX count and you see there are some memory allocations with some macro called malloc. And you see every time it uses the malloc, it does a multiplication inside. And uh, there's like no uh, check that there is like uh, a small demox count so this cannot overflow. So in both cases it can overflow. And in the end you see a copy in. And you might think that this is like the, the overflow here, but it's uh, the buffer overflow here, but it's not the buffer overflow because the size you're copying is also calculated by multiplication. And so of course this is the same small number. Uh, that you get in the allocation, so there's no overflow. Yeah, for, the over, for the buffer overflow, you have to go to the end of the function. In the end of the function, you see that it goes, it loops through all the, uh, the input and converts it into a different format. Um, and you also see there's an error condition that you can trigger in order that the loop breaks, so you don't like copy until the end of the memory so that you crash. So two things you want to know is what can you write and can you break out of it? So you look into this function and you will see that it's quite easy to skip out of this function because there are two conditions that will exit the function immediately. So it's very easy. If you don't want it to crash, just put, just put this uh, kind of values there and it will not crash because it will stop the, uh, the loop. Uh, the other thing that's less nice is you see that you don't have much control over what you're actually writing. Yeah, you control the type, yeah, but it's only like two bytes and uh, there's some limit on it uh, because of the check before. And okay, there's a length field that you write. It's also not very nice. But the other thing that's written is very nice. And in this case, it helps you to exploit it because it writes a pointer to data you just wrote into the kernel. This is very nice because of how you exploit the memory manager. But we come to that now. Uh, well, yeah. Um, if you want to trigger that, 
Uh, this would be the code. The problem is when you execute this code, it will not crash because uh, the um, the actual checks are so good that um, the, these two checks in the, in the beginning of this function they will most likely uh, stop the execution in the very first loop. So. Um, uh, in the very first loop of the overflow, so they will just drop out and there will be no overflow. So in order to actually uh, cause an overflow, you have to call this set so socket option once with a normal Dmux count so that you can fill a block of memory with whatever data you want. And then you call it again with the overflow and it will reuse the same block of memory if you did the heap manipulation uh, correctly before. And then you, uh, at a point where the overflow is, uh, because you're in the same block as before, you can just like overwrite with the data that was put by you before. But uh, you don't need to know the details. The exact walkthrough to every line of the exploit and the source code for the exploit will be released somewhere in, uh, in, later in August. So um, you saw that it's using some memory allocation here in, in malloc. Uh, w with a macro called malloc. Malloc is a macro that uh, calls a function called underscore malloc. And this is just a wrapper around uh, calloc. And uh, the thing, what it wraps is it, it adds a small header to it, which contains a size field, and it needs a size field to na later uh, free the right uh, thing. And uh, calloc itself is again a wrapper around two different uh, allocator, allocators, the kmem alloc allocator and the zone allocator, set alloc. And the one, one of them is it is uh, used for large blocks and the other one is for, used for small blocks. Um, we, only we are only interested in the small blocks right now, so we don't care about the other one. So set alloc is a zone allocator, which means it, the memory is, uh, um, yeah, divided into zones. Well, let's call it divided into. And you see there's a quite long structure that defines a zone, and this structure, um, yeah, has the possibility to have a lot of flags for the, for the zones, but we don't care about this right now. And each zone has a name, like buffers, or files, or something like that. And, um, the other thing about zones is that each element you allocate in a zone is of the same size. So when a zone is created, you say every element in here is like 128 bytes. And the other thing is when you have a f uh, free something in the zone, it's put to a, a zone, um, a free list that is started with a pointer in the, inside the structure. Um, what you don't have if you don't have the debugging kernel um, you have no way to know all the memory pages that belong to a zone. Unless you are somehow able to free all the memory and then go through the free list. But if there's like a page belonging to a zone that is full of, uh, of uh, allocated blocks, there's no way to know that. Because there's no uh, pointer back. If you don't have like a, a debugging kernel. So uh, when you want to know what kind of stones there exist yes, on OS X, you can just like use a set print utility and it will uh, dump something like that. And you see there's a, cal there's a lot of calloc zones with a number attached. And this is basically uh, for the calloc allocator. It uses a lot of different zones, uh, always powers of two for the, for the size. And so uh, when you request something with k alloc, it will uh, check what size, uh, how much bytes it uh, it's needs to the next power of two and then it will use this kind of size for the allocation. Okay, let's look at a new uh, memory page, a new zone. When, when you have a new zone, it's completely empty. There's no free list, there's no memory, no nothing. And the first thing that happens is it will allocate a, a memory page. And um, yeah, like I said, there's no like pointer back. So the next thing that happens is we'll divide the zone into uh, elements, let's say 128 bytes, and then each element is added to the free list. And you see in the end you have like the free list in the reverse order. And then once you, um, you have this zone ready to, to be used, um, 
you can like allocate memory. It will be removed from the free list. Allocate again and again and again. And you see only the free elements are in the free list. And once you start freeing the elements again, in this case, you freed the fifth element, then you see it's put back on the, on the free list. It's like a normal, well, a simple free list. Yeah, let's do this for the other elements. So now you see you have still the same elements in the free list, but there's a different order. Internally, this is implemented as a single linked list with the zone struct pointing to the head of the list. And um, the free list, the pointer for the next element in the free list is stored inbound. The first four bytes of a, of a free block are used to store the pointer to the next element in the free list. And Apple uses uh, some macros for that, which look very complicated. Uh, but you don't care about the gray stuff. Uh, just look for the, uh, the green stuff for a moment. What it does, it, it's, in this case, you remove something from the zone. That means you allocate the memory. So what it does, it, it, it looks um, up the current head of the, of the free list, takes this, returns that. But before it returns that, it takes the uh, pointer to the next element in the free list from there and makes this the new head. So there's a lot of debugging code in there and sanity checks and things that would make exploitation harder, but they are disabled by default. Uh, you need to set a special debugging boot argument to the kernel uh, to actually activate it. But uh, I saw in the Lion's source code um, that Apple obviously for a while has, or well, they introduced this new boot arguments and they obviously tried to activate this by default. They disabled it again, but uh, it seems they might consider to activate this in the future. Uh, I don't know, there were some bug numbers attached to it, so, well, so they disabled it again. I don't know why they disabled it again, but maybe in the future they will just enable it for all things. Similar, when you um, actually free something, it's the reverse thing. Um, you just uh, go to the, uh, the head of the free, Uh, no. Um, no. When you free a block, you take the momentary head of the free list, write it into the first four bytes, and then you set the new head to this free block. And again, there are some sanity checks uh, which are disabled by default. Okay, how can you exploit that? Of course, when you have a heap overflow, you can always attack the application data. Uh, what you try is you carefully allocate and deallocate so that you control the heap layout. And what you want to have is like a, a buffer with a very interesting kernel structure behind uh, uh, a buffer that you overflow. And the impact depends on uh, actually what you can write and what kind of uh, the structures you overwrite. Um, at the moment, we can just ignore that because there is no mitigation inside the, uh, the kernel. Uh, heap at the moment, so it's easier to use the other way, especially for the exploit we are doing. So we remind, remember that for the future, right now, we just exploit the, this, the free list of the zone allocator. So what we do here is we just like allocate and deallocate again and control the heap so that we have a free, free block behind our overflowing block. And when we overflow the block, we control the uh, the, fourth four, the first four bytes of the free block, which means we overwrite the, the next element in the free list. And so now when the memory is allocated and this element that we have there, the free block, is allocated, then the pointer from there is taken and put on the top of the free list. So afterwards, the next element that is allocated will be actually the pointer we gave it. And when this is returned and filled with application data, we can write nearly everything everywhere. So how do you do all this kernel manipulation thing? Uh, you usually need, need uh, heap manipulation uh, primitives, like things that allows you to allocate a, a block of memory in a specific size and to deallocate some memory. And in our case, it's very easy to do that. Um, because we are dealing with n -drive sockets and anyway, so we can just take, take the uh, n -drive, uh, socket again. And when you connect an n -drive socket, uh, you, give it, you can give it a, a name. 
with like a small but arbitrary length. And if you do that, you control the size of the, uh, of the block that is allocated in heap. So you just uh, use different lengths of, for the socket name and you can uh, allocate different kinds of memory. And again, when you want to deallocate the memory, you just close the socket. So you can allocate and deallocate. And yet you, now you do something called heap feng shui. Mm. I guess most people know that. It's a term uh, created by Alex Sotirov. And um, yeah, it basically describes the whole thing like how to uh, get, a, get a heap into a controlled state from an unknown uh, previous state. So what you do normally is you can see that the orange boxes are actually allocated memory and the gray boxes are holes in the memory. What you do first is yeah, you allocate memory of this block size as often as there is a hole. And afterwards, you allocate some more that you have a bunch of uh, consecutive uh, memory blocks. And now you can poke a hole by closing one of the sockets. And you poke the hole there. And then you do it again so that you have a second empty block. And when you allocate something now, the last free block was, uh, was the top of the free list. So the last free block was this one. So when it's allocated, it gives you this. And if this overflows now, you overflow the free block. And you can do this thing like replace the next element in the free list. So this is the normal way how you do like a, a kernel. Uh, no, like you do heap feng shui. So because normally, you have no idea about the state of the kernel, of this kernel heap. And so you you usually don't know how many holes there are in the memory. So you don't know how often you have to do, repeat this allocation um, until you have like really a consecutive memory blocks. But Apple is very nice here. Uh, I, I showed you the, the zprint uh, command line tool. And actually, it's the same technique. It's used a, 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 a kernel function called host zone info. And this function gives you all this information you saw previously in, in the separate utility. It gives it to you in a form of a structure, a C structure. And this contains the, uh, the count of elements actually allocated at the moment in the zone. It gives you um, the size of the zone at the moment. In, um, and you can divide that by the uh, size of an element. And you know how many elements are, should be allocated. And when you know how many are allocated and how big the, the zone at the moment is, then you know how many are free. So you know exactly how many uh, holes there are in the heap. And this gives you the idea how many uh, allocations you have to do to fill all the holes. So you know exactly in iOS and macOS, you know exactly when the, the kernel heap and all the holes are closed. Well, of course, you, they could remove the function because I don't know if they really need it. Uh, the point is, uh, even if they remove it, then, well, then you do it the old school and you just repeat as often as you believe it's enough. So uh, you repeat it a few thousand times and uh, maybe a little bit more. And uh, yeah, at some point, you will be out of heap uh, holes. Well, the other thing is, because you can uh, request this information, you know exactly when a new block, a new page is added to the, uh, to the zone. And then it's easier for you to know exactly uh, where two memory blocks are relative to each other. Because then you know exactly that, that this memory block is right in front of the other because, it's because of the reverse order. Otherwise, you might end up in a situation when you have like one memory block in one page and one memory block in the other page. And because of the reverse order of the free list, you don't know uh, which one is before the other. Okay, so to make things short, in order to do and actually to get code execution here, um, you have, well, we attempt to overwrite a free block. And the idea is to replace the pointer inside the free list. But we cannot do that because uh, we cannot control what is overwritten by our overflow. We only know our overflow is writing a pointer. And it's writing a pointer to data we control. So OK, we let's, uh, let the overflow do that. So the overflow will write into 
the free list pointer a pointer to our data. It will do that for us. So the next time something is allocated, it will actually uh, put our block that we control into the head of the free list. The next time something is allocated, the block that we completely control is taken and returned, and the first four bytes that we completely control will be made the head of the free list. And then again, you take the next allocation, and now the pointer we provided will be, over, uh, will be used. This means we can put it anywhere in memory. And a nice place is in the middle of the syscall table. So uh, the next allocation now will return the middle of the syscall table. And if the kernel c uh, copies some data into this uh, just allocated block, it's in, we can write in the middle of the syscall table. And what I did in the exploit was I was using some uh, area of the syscall table that's uh, filled with uh, unused syscalls. And I just used one so that the system wasn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't be interrupted. Um, and in this case, it was 207. The stuff around 207 is uh, a bunch of unused syscall. So this was the easiest way to do it. So I just write in the middle of that, overwrite the, uh, the syscall handler for 207. And then I just have a user space code that calls syscall 207. And voila, I'm in the kernel. And of course, I can uh, do all these kind of things again uh, to uh, like return to, uh, to user land code. Or and what I did was I was returning into uh, the syscall arguments. So I, I made it a syscall with a lot of arguments. And then I returned into a kernel address that would uh, yeah, BLX jump into the Reg register one, I think, was it, into register one. And register one was a pointer to the kernel arguments. So I jumped into my own kernel arguments. And like I said, it's somewhere on the heap, on the kernel heap. And it's just executable. So um, yeah, that's what I did um, in the latest exploit um, of comics in jbreakme.com. He did a far more complicated kernel rob payload. Uh, but it's not always ne needed. OK, let's get to the, to the last part of the talk, uh, the jailbreakers kernel patches. First thing is, what do the jailbreaks actually patch? Um, it depends on the, on the jailbreak, on, on who wrote it, and, um, and what ex box they exploit, because uh, especially when you have a heap overflow, you sometimes have to repair some stuff. I was a little bit lazy. I just removed the free of the, of the <laughs> destructed heap. So, so I just removed the free comment. And so uh, the uh, corrupted memory was just not freed. It was kept uh, alive. And um, well, it didn't cause any problems I know of. Uh, it, well, you waste a lot of, uh, not a lot, uh, you waste a bit of memory with that. But uh, well, it worked. And um, if you want to do it cleanly, you have to like, go through the free list and uh, um, figure out what page belonged to, uh, to what of, uh, which of the zones, and then put each element back in the right free list and things like that. So uh, it's a little bit tricky. Um, OK. But the other patches in, inside the jailbreaks are just disabling security features. And they're also different for, uh, because the different groups uh, patch different places. And uh, nowadays, most of them rely on patches developed by comics because they seem to be the most stable. Uh, OK, sometimes he has a patch that doesn't work at all. But uh, yeah, well, you just tell him and he will find a better one. And um, it's always easier to, to ship out the, uh, the complicated work to other people. Um, no, don't invent the, uh, the, the wheel twice. So he does it all the time. So you just take it. And uh, he has a, you can see it on GitHub. You can uh, download uh, it and see what he's actually doing and how he finds those places to patch. And I would just go through all the patches he's doing uh, just to give you an idea uh, what he's actually doing. Okay. 
I'm actually quite fast. Um, okay, so um, the first thing it tries to disable is the, uh, the code signing. And uh, therefore, it, uh, yeah, well, pr process restrictions and code signing. And the first thing it does, uh, it um, disables a um, sysctl variable called proc enforce. This is the same variable that's previously used. Uh, previously, Rob payloads were just like disabling it as root user. But uh, with 4. something, 4.3, 4.3.0, Apple uh, decided that it would be better to have this as read only variable. So uh, with 4.3.0, it's not possible to set this as root anymore. So um, you have to patch it from the kernel. And this actually allows you to. Uh, execute wrongly signed binaries. Uh, the other thing it disables is, um, or enables better, it uh, enables the CS enforcement uh, disable flag, which is the boot argument to, uh, to the kernel. And this disables the enforcement of code signing. This allows you to get around the code signing stuff. The next thing that's done is, uh, there's a function inside the kernel that is called PE I can has debugger. And um, in earlier jailbreaks, Comex was just replacing that with a return one. This turned out to be bad. Because uh, that's the reason why Comex is not the one who, uh, who did the kernel debugger first. Because when you, when you just return one, the kernel debugger will not work. Um, well, no, that's not true. It will work, but uh, the, the halt on, on boot feature will not work of the kernel debugger. It will then crash. Um, so nowadays, Comex just looks up the, uh, you see in the second line of the function, it's requesting a, a, a variable from memory. And nowadays, you know, Comex such patches this uh, variable to one. Uh, so then uh, this function will return one, and everything is OK. And um, according to Comex, uh, what it does is uh, it will allow that the uh, Apple mobile file integrity driver will allow non-signed binaries. Previous was for uh, wrongly signed binaries. This is for not signed binaries. Um, it also disables various other checks. And um, like I said, you need it for the kernel debugger to run perfectly. Yeah. So that's what you need to know about this. And um, it's just setting one byte in memory to one. So it's a very simple patch. Then, especially in the older kernels, there was no way to have uh, read-write executable memory. It was simply forbidden by the kernel to have something like that. Um, in the newer kernel, you have this uh, dynamic code signing. So uh, there are exceptions, as far as I know. Yeah. You're commenting all the time. <laughs> yeah, so um, basically, uh, the patch from Comics replaces uh, um, yeah, the check with a knob. Um, and so the f now memory can be read-wide executable. Otherwise, if that's not patched, then the kernel will see, oh, there's a prod execute, and it will just clear it. This just allows you to have uh, the memory at all, the read-write executable memory. Um, there's a second patch required to allow mProtect to, uh, to have read-write executable memory. So here, there's a similar check. And for some reason, uh, well, Comex choose a different way to patch it. Here, he just uh, patches the, the bit clear uh, opcode directly and just clears uh, no bit. Previously, it, it, it um, replaced. Yeah, previously uh, he um, it was the fourth bit, and now it's uh, the zeroth bit that he clears, which is uh, not used in this case. Yeah, I think that was it. Or yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, he writes a zero there, and so that this uh, opcode will not do anything that's uh, affecting the, code, uh, the, the RWX memory. Um, yeah, the next thing, it, it's patched. And uh, if you see the slides from the, uh, from the CD, 
you will miss this slide because I had like a few slides missing when I submitted it to Black Hat. So uh, the next thing that was uh, patched is the AMFI binary trust cache, um, which is like a cache for all the uh, yeah, trusted applications. And Comics just replaced it with a, with a return one so that uh, it's not used. And the next thing is, when you look at the jailbreaks, um, actually when you look at the Tesseract jailbreak that is fresh for a new iOS version, um, so you use Red Snow on a new version it was not designed for, then you will see that uh, some applications won't work. Like uh, when, when you try to start Safari, it will just crash. This is because uh, um, it doesn't patch the, the sandbox in the uh, plain Red Snow version for, uh, for something that it doesn't know. And um, the reason here is when you, when you jailbreak, it moves all the stuff around. All the applications are moved around. And of course, uh, the, the sandboxes are not uh, working anymore because now when it tries to extract something, uh, it's not an original sandbox uh, policy and it will be uh, like killed in this case. Oh, actually, I should show the slide. Um, yeah. So what Comex does is um, he goes to the function called SB Evaluate, Sandbox Evaluate, and puts a hook in there. And uh, the hook basically redirects it to some uh, code that you can also look in, at, at, into, uh, at GitHub. And this hook will uh, replace the logic of the uh, SB Evaluate function to check for specific paths. So if the access is outside of private var mobile, it will be allowed. If the access is inside private var mobile library preferences com apple something, it's going through the original evaluation. It's like passing to the original handler. When it's in another subdirectory of this uh, private mobile library preferences, then its uh, access is granted. And everything else goes through the original uh, check. So you see that uh, the sandbox is not completely disabled here. Uh, they just made some exceptions so that it would still work. Yeah, and that is like uh, the presentation. Um, there will be a bunch of downloads that I will uh, upload to my site once I'm uh, back in Germany and repair the server, which is broken at the moment. Um, yeah, it's stupid when like server dies when you are not in, in, in the country. So um, I will finally release the uh, IDA scripts that I used in the presentation from, uh, uh, from Singapore. I will release a jailbreak configuration tool that allows you to uh, configure the jailbreak to uh, disable only a few of the protections. This was requested by Charlie Miller because it makes um, um, yeah, exploiting on a jailbroken device uh, yeah, more realistic. Um, I will upload the latest slides because uh, these slides are a little bit different from the one that I submitted to Black Hat. I will also update the white paper and um, yeah, some other things I will upload, like a description of the exploit, the source code of the untesser, and things like that. And yeah, you can get it at antidote.com. And yeah, the, mo the server is broken at the moment. If you want the slides before, just uh, drop me an email. I can send uh, it to you. And yeah, any questions? Oh, before I forget, please fill out the feedback forms. Um, yeah. Otherwise, any question? What? How long did it take to reload from your original craft? For the uh, second bug. Um, well, the problem is it took a very long time because of one simple thing. Uh, at the time when I found the, the bug and had did the exploit, 
it was, well, it took a while to do the original exploit, but then uh, suddenly 4.3.0 came out and I could uh, sew the exploit into the trash can because uh, suddenly uh, the whole exploit had to be completely ROP. So it took a while to uh, build a ROP framework and then you know, port all this kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, like maybe a week or so just uh, in my free time and something like that, yeah. More questions? No questions? Okay, then I'm... Mm. Sorry, there's one last thing. Um, um, I told you I will release the jailbreak configurator and um, this will look something like this. So a simple application that allows you to switch off and on these things, which is like 10 minutes of, uh, well, the GUI is 10 minutes of code in, in Xcode, so it's not very hard. Uh, just communicating with the jailbreak is hard, and I'm also trying to uh, speak with Comex to, uh, like, make this uh, usable with, uh, with jailbreakme.com. Yeah, that was it. <laughs>